Water pollution occurs when pollutants contaminate a body of water, streams, rivers, lakes, oceans, or groundwater. Sources of pollutants can be agricultural, industrial, or municipal. One of the largest contributors to water pollution is agriculture. This contribution results from fertilizer runoff and pesticide runoff, both of which pose large threats to aquatic ecosystems. Now we've briefly talked about the impacts of fertilizer runoff, but let's go into more detail now. Eutrophication is a process that occurs when a body of water is enriched with extra nutrients. The most common way this happens is through agriculture with the, well, fertilizer runoff, but it can also occur through wastewater release. The increase of nutrients in a body of water, notably nitrogen and phosphorus compounds, cause algae populations to increase very quickly. All this algae eventually depletes the water of nutrients and this high algae population can no longer be supported. So much of it dies off. Microbes will then digest the dead algae, but these microbes are a aerobic, meaning they use oxygen. Because there's so much available stuff to eat, the microbes deplete the water of the dissolved oxygen. This rapid decrease in available oxygen results in large die-offs of fish and other aquatic organisms. A body of water with low oxygen is called hypoxic, meaning it has low available oxygen. Some algal blooms, however, are also toxic. Red tide is an example of an algal bloom that contains species of algae that produce harmful toxins. This occurs quite frequently around the coast of Florida, and this leads to human health impacts, especially those with respiratory problems. These are also toxic to marine life, resulting in their death too. There are some bodies of water that are naturally high in nutrient content. We call these eutrophic waterways. These are not a problem unless humans cause the eutrophic state. Oligotrophic waterways are those that have naturally low nutrients, which leads to very stable algal populations and high levels of dissolved oxygen. And those are the ones that are at risk of nutrient contamination. Now we can plot out, especially in rivers, the dissolved oxygen levels versus the distance from a source of nutrient pollution using an oxygen sag curve. Biological oxygen demand represents the amount of oxygen consumed by bacteria and microorganisms as they decompose organic matter. We can see this in the diagram. Before a discharge of nutrients, the BOD is low and dissolved oxygen is high. At the source of the discharge, there's a sharp increase in the biological oxygen demand because, well, all the microorganisms are consuming a lot of dissolved oxygen causing the dissolved oxygen to decrease. Farther away, there's less material to decompose, so there's fewer microorganisms. So the BOD plummets and the DO begins to increase before we get to another clear zone. Pesticide runoff is another issue from agriculture. Pesticides used on farms can also enter bodies of water where they are absorbed and they can impact aquatic organisms. Some pesticides are part of a large group of chemicals called persistent organic pollutants, which are chemicals that do not easily break down in the environment. POPs have been shown to travel large distances via wind and water currents before they're deposited somewhere else, so they're very mobile. So pop pollution is not limited to the source. Better yet, many pops are fat soluble, meaning they are stored in fatty tissue which allows the pollutant to accumulate in an organism's fatty tissue. Bioaccumulation is the selective absorbance and increased concentration of compounds by cells in a living organism. We've seen this before when I mentioned how the accumulation of DDT in eagles led to their producing thinner eggshells, causing low survival rates, putting them on the endangered species list. But many pollutants that accumulate in tissue also biomagnify. A biomagnification is the increase in concentration of substances per unit of body tissue in higher trophic levels. A pollutant enters the waterways and is absorbed by phytoplankton through diffusion. The phytoplankton are then eaten by zooplankton, which are eaten by other organisms, so on and so forth, and at each successive trophic level, the concentration of this pollutant increases. 
PCBs are another type of POP that bioaccumulates and biomagnifies. Now, PCBs are synthetic compounds that are used in electronic equipment and in many coatings to make them fire resistant. Because so many items containing PCBs were improperly disposed of, all these chemicals made their way into ecosystems and have been found to affect the fertility of marine organisms and have also shown to impact immune system function. Mercury is another substance that bioaccumulates and biomagnifies. Even worse, mercury enters waterways from coal-fired power plants and is then absorbed by bacteria in the water and converted into methylmercury, which is ridiculously toxic, and it can pass the blood-brain barrier and damage brain tissue. It can impair growth, brain development, which leads to learning disabilities in humans and leads to high mortality in wildlife. This is dangerous for humans because mercury biomagnifies all the way up to the fish we like to eat, like pike and tuna. Yeah, the fish you eat. Oil spills are a prominent example of water pollution. Oil spills in marine waters can cause organisms to die due to the hydrocarbons present in the oil. Some of them are toxic. Oil that floats on the surface of water can coat the feathers of birds and the fur of marine mammals, reducing their insulation in cold water and can prevent the flight of birds. Some components of oil sink all the way to the ocean floor and can kill bottom-dwelling organisms as well. Oil that washes up on the beach can have economic consequences on the fishing and tourism industries. Uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, an oil rig owned by British Petroleum, was the largest in recent history, engulfing the majority of the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. The cleanup effort took more than three years, and is actually still ongoing. And studies showed that tuna and dolphins that were exposed to the oil had developed deformities in their hearts. 148 people were hospitalized as a result of oil exposure and the estimated economic loss due to limitations to commercial recreational fishing revenues added up to be about as high as $8.7 billion. Plastic pollution, despite being unsightly, can create intestinal blockage and choking hazards for wildlife. And it can also introduce toxic substances into the food chain. Now, plastic itself isn't very toxic. It's the compounds the plastic has accumulated that could be toxic. There are two massive garbage patches in the Pacific Ocean, and they're kept in place by the ocean currents. It contains an estimated 87 tons of plastic, totaling 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic. Size estimates put the patch at about 700,000 square miles, which is the size of Texas. Thermal pollution occurs when heat is released into the water. This is very common along power plants as water from rivers and lakes is used for cooling and then is then discharged back. Warmer water temperatures are an issue because warmer water has a lower capacity to hold oxygen than colder water. Areas experiencing thermal pollution have lower dissolved oxygen concentrations resulting in decreased fish populations. The last type of water pollution I want to discuss actually affects drinking water. Lead pollution in drinking water is a very specific issue that generally results from old service pipes that contain lead. Now in 1986, the use of lead in plumbing pipes was banned, but many old service lines still remain. For the most part, these pipes are coated and the water is treated and they're mostly safe unless disturbed. Now, if the pipes are disturbed due to construction or an earthquake, the coating may chip off and expose lead to the water. Now, we know that Flint, Michigan had a lead water crisis, and what happened there was a disaster that should have been avoided. Flint, Michigan officials changed the source of water in Flint, Michigan from Lake Huron and the Detroit River over to the Flint River. Now, the Flint River had a lower pH, which eroded away the coating on the pipes. And this ended up exposing over 100,000 residents to high levels of lead. So how can we deal with all these pollutants? Agriculture runoff can be dealt with by planting buffer zones along agricultural areas and increasing the use of integrated pest management to reduce the amount of chemical pesticides used. Oil spills are clean in a few ways. Dispersion involves using chemicals that remove oil from the water by breaking them up into smaller droplets. 
However, the toxicity of dispersants can affect marine organisms, especially coral reefs. Sometimes oil is burned directly on the water, but the toxic fumes can cause damage to the environment and marine life. It is essentially unmitigated pollution, generally not a good choice. Skimming is a way to remove thin layers of oil from the surface, which is useful in that the oil can then be recovered and still used, so it's economically viable. But because of a large amount of trash debris in the ocean, skimmers get clogged very frequently, making skimming a very time-consuming process. And now for the poopy part. Wastewater treatment is a process that we use to treat our sewage. And this happens in four main stages, sometimes three, it depends where you are. Stage one is primary treatment. And the goal of primary treatment is to remove large debris like rocks and diapers, small particulates and oils and fats. First, sewage passes through a screen to remove the large debris. The wastewater and smaller debris goes through and enters a settling tank. In the settling tank, smaller particles like sand and suspended solids, that's poo by the way, settle to the bottom and any oils and fats float on top. The fats and oils are skimmed off and the settled material, referred to as sludge, is then sent to secondary treatment. In secondary treatment, the suspended organic material is broken down by microorganisms. Air is pumped into the tank because the organisms that fulfill this are aerobic and the oxygen helps them do their job. Yes, the microorganisms literally eat your poo, which seems disgusting, but they love the stuff. After all that is done, what settles on the bottom is a much thicker sludge that kind of settles out, and sometimes it's called biosolids. Depending on the treatment process used, biosolids are actually totally safe. All the poopy stuff has been removed and can be used as fertilizer in some limited cases. That said, the water being free of poop material still has some metals and other undesirable materials. Flocculating agents like alum and sodium hydroxide are added and flocculation results in these metals precipitating out in a material called flock. These eventually sink to the bottom and can be disposed of. The next step is tertiary treatment, and in this process the water from stage 2 is run through a bed of gravel, pebbles, coarse sand, and fine sand. This traps any leftover particulates from many different sizes. In some cases, tertiary treatment also includes allowing the water to run through an artificial wetland to remove any nutrients that may still be present, like nitrates and phosphates, to reduce the risk of eutrophication wherever the well, wastewater is then released. The last step is disinfection, and actually sometimes occurs before stage three. It gets weird. Now, disinfection looks different in many different wastewater treatment plants. Some plants use ultraviolet light to kill bacteria. Uh, some pour chlorine into the water, and some plants pump ozone into the water. They all serve the same purpose. They kill any harmful bacteria. The water that results from all these stages is technically safe enough to drink, but public perception about drinking treated wastewater is a little, uh, poopy? But in any case, it's returned to the environment through a pipe into some body of water. Now, the caveat here is that not all wastewater treatment plants use all three stages, which may cause regional problems with nutrient pollution or bacterial contamination. There are two main laws that regulate water pollution, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Drinking Water Act. The Clean Water Act does a much similar thing like the Clean Air Act did, right? It sets standards for industries and it sets limits to pollutants that are released into the environment. In fact, the Clean Water Act made it illegal to discharge any pollutant from a point source into navigable waters unless a permit is obtained through the EPA. And after that, the water is heavily regulated, tested, and any excess pollution is, well, fine. The Clean Drinking Water Act regulates tap water in the United States, whether it's from an above ground source like lakes and rivers or groundwater. It establishes standards for what the safe level of any contaminants that can be found in drinking water are. It makes sure that any drinking water is safe for human consumption. Both of these acts are enforced through the EPA. As a quick aside, Many sources of tap water in the United States 
have stricter standards and are safer than some brands of bottled water. So save the plastic, grab your refillable bottle, and drink from the tap. Unless otherwise specified due to local water quality issues. And believe me, if you live in an area with poor drinking water quality, you are aware.